have to pause as we begin and uh, break script or whatever we are going to do next and just express my heart. I'm, I'm just um, blessed to be here. I, I am, I don't know how else to say, I'm just in love with you guys. I, I, I am blessed to be here and I'm honored to just be in this city and at this church. I, I, I was feeling this all morning and now we should be going to this Advent sermon and we should be going to my jokes and things like that, but uh, the spirit leads and you have to follow. And so I'm, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but I, I, I couldn't be authentic to you if I didn't express that I, I just really love you. I'm burdened for your problems. Um, I wish I could do more. Uh, I am just really grateful to be in this city at this church. I, I mean, I get to sit on the front row and watch my daughters and my son-in-law just praise the Lord. Why aren't you guys sitting together? Is there... <laughs> I, just, uh, I just recognize that. <laughs> and... I just want more for you. I, I wish I had the ticket, you know, that, that was your ticket to heaven and, and, and God's way. I, I wish I could do it for you. That's just my desire. And um, it, it might not fit, but it doesn't matter because it's just we're family. We love one another. And we have been called to this city. We've been called together. And so just... Just transparent moment. I, I just was very um, all morning. I, I, I don't know what God has to say to us today. I really don't. I don't know what this encounter and this experience, you know, God didn't send his son Jesus so we could have a Sunday morning show with lights and good looking worship leaders. God sent his son Jesus to give us life, abundant life, a life of joy and a life of of just being thankful, and I'm thankful, Th just thankful to be um, your friend and, and, and your pastor. And we, we had a week. We had life come this week. We had death come this week. We had members with guns to their heads being stolen from this week. We had a week, and we're in this together. In the name of Jesus, love is born and, and hope is here. Amen. Amen. All right, let me get myself together. All right, very good. Sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, you can be dismissed. Thanks for being here, young people. Uh, it is a year in giving uh, time, and if you've ever been to a summer camp or you've been on a mission trip, you know how it's impacted your life. If you're looking for something to give here at the end of the year, a year in giving, uh, our youth uh, directors would love to... Um, have a donations to summer camps and mission trips. You just want to write a check for $50, $100, $5, $5, and just mark it in the memo, youth camp or youth retreats or youth uh, mission trips. Charvis and Hannah would be blessed if you're looking for a year-in giving option. Um, on that moment, just a little, this isn't a part of the sermon, so don't, don't, don't start timing, okay? Um, I want to give you a little update on our faced, faced? Face the face, a face lift campaign. We have been raising money um, to improve our campus, and you are sitting on generosity this morning. Uh, through that generosity, we were be, uh, were able to do this. We were trying to raise two hundred thousand dollars in three months to um, give our property uh, a, a facelift. And I want to give you a little bit of a an update, if that's okay. And if it's not, um, you'll, you'll you'll be okay. We have received $72,000 in cash of the $200,000. 72, those aren't clapping, or you're reaching for your wallets, right? You're doing something. $72,000 in cash. Amen. Um, we've had some companies also donate some things, and they're humble men and women, and they don't want their names to be um, said. But we had a, a flooring uh, company give us an, an incredible discount on this flooring and our future flooring, um, so much so that it is saving us 
um, $15,000. We've had um, another flooring um, company uh, donate 100% of the labor for the new carpet. Um, and they also uh, provided all the materials and obviously the, lab- the labor for both buildings. They just donated that. So that saved us $15,000. We've had um, a construction company and a roofing company um, agree to donate their labor and donate all the material for our new um, roofs. And that's going to save us $20,000. And so I thought, those, um, I thought those four things were very, very important for you to know. The generosity of the men and women you're sitting next to and, and just um, what, what God is doing here through us uh, together. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Uh, also, uh, parents and grandparents, we have some resources for you that follows that video that you see every week. It follows our sermon series. Uh, first week was Give More. Last week was love all, this week is spend less, and then the final week will be worship fully. And there's some activities that you can do together as a family, Um, just little uh, things you can sit down and and write together. So parents, this is a great resource for you. This is this week, this is last week, and um, you you can participate in these. Grandparents, grab them too. They're on the welcome table and in the, uh, the brick patio as well. Okay, there you go. There's uh, just a few announcements. Spend less is this week. Now, we're not anti-shopping. I don't want you to think that I am saying don't go spend money, that you shouldn't give anybody gifts. That's not what we're saying. I've had many of you come to me and say uh, that you just feel guilty that I saw you in Target. <laughs> you know, I, I'm coming in Target and, 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 and people are trying to hide. You know, it's like I'm spending money. Am I going to hell? You know, kind of thing. And that's not what we're saying. I just I have a quick question for you. Uh, what was the one gift you remember getting last year? What was maybe the fourth gift you remember getting last year? You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about that anxiety that we have out of obligation. Those gifts that we give that aren't attached to joy. It's very joyful to give a gift. I gave a gift to my friend Nick here, and Major's wearing it. So I'm just very privileged of that. (laughs) We're not talking about anti-shopping. We're we're talking about spending less on gifts that we don't need or we know other people don't need and, and giving more time with each other. And so this morning, we're going to look at the story of the wise men. We have decided this year to combat this war on Christmas, that we're just going to tell the story. Last week, we learned about the shepherds. This week, we will learn about um, the wise men. That that is what we're feeling like the best way to bring in this Christmas season is to, to tell this story. And we're going to Look at King Herod, who was an awful person, a a, a ruthless leader, a killer, who had it all but didn't have it all. And look at Mary and Joseph, who had nothing but had everything. Are you with me? King Herod had it all but didn't really have anything. And Mary and Joseph, who didn't have anything but really had it all. We're going to look at that part of the story today. The wise men had a focus The birth of Jesus was on their mind, and so they went and pursued truth. That was on their mind. So I'd ask you this morning, what is on your mind? What are you seeking right now? Because whatever you choose to place your focus on dominates your life. That extra gift, that that other ornament that you have to put on the tree, what that party you have to go to, that other thing you have to add to your calendar. Whatever you're focused on right now dominates your life. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. And before you judge me, because you will, before you judge me, let me explain. I like, and, and, and if I'm in your shoes, I might make the decisions you do. And if you're in my shoes, you might make the decisions I do. I grew up in a different place. You grew up in a different place. This is just me. The the fill-in-the-blank moment, this is just me, okay? 
So before you judge me when this story begins, just keep that in your mind, okay? You guys are looking really judgy here on the front row. No secret, I love sneakers, okay? It's just my thing. I like sneakers. Before you judge me, maybe you use your money to buy guns, or maybe you use your money to buy golf clubs, or maybe you use your money to buy purses, or maybe you buy watches, or maybe you fill in the blank. I don't know what your thing is. I tend to, if I have a few extra dollars, I like sneakers, okay? It's just my thing. No judging, okay? No judging. A few years ago, 10 years ago to be exact, there is a, a part of my culture, sneaker culture, there is a, a, a basketball player who, again, I think is the greatest basketball player of all time, the GOAT, if you will, Michael Jordan. Debate. I know there's a debate between people younger than me, and they're just wrong, but <laughs> he has a line of sneakers that are very popular that have, have kind of gone beyond him. And they, and they re-release them. And I'm really into that, okay? I'm really into when they are released. Because I used to have the original, and I want them, and I can't afford them. And, but they were being released, and I just wanted to be a part of the day that they released. And I wanted to go to the store to see if maybe I could afford them. Or I just wanted to be a part of it. It was kind of a cool thing. And so as I was driving on the highway, that was on my mind. Sneakers were on my mind. Don't judge me. So it was dominating my, my mind and what I was about to do. It was on my mind. Now I'm a person of routine, and that day I was going to visit one of my best friends who owns a surf shop. Now at Hope Point, we have Hoops Church. At New Life Pismo Beach, we had Surf Church. And we had a church on Sunday nights only for surfers. Now my brother Matt and I, uh, I was invited, Matt wasn't. I was the only non-surfer invited to this surf church. I've only surfed once. Only surfer invited to the surf church. I was called a kook or a poser or a pretender. I'm not a surfer. I wear surfer type clothing sometimes and shirts. I like the brands. But they invited me to be a part of the surf church. I love the surf church. And so every week I would go visit our pastor of the surf church who owned a surf shop. Are you with me? I know this is getting longer. So I'm on the highway, and I'm just thinking about sneakers, and I got to do this, and then I got to go check out my sneakers. So I'm exiting the highway, and as I exit the highway, there's a red light, and as I'm at that top of the highway, there's a man on the side of the street that has a cardboard sign that says, I need shoes. I'm not making this up. Sometimes people think pastors make stories up. I'm not making this story up. This is fact. I need shoes. Now, I did what you would have done. I rolled down the window, and I said, what size? And he goes, well, 10 and a half, but that doesn't matter because you won't do anything about it. And I said, no, no, I will be back. And he goes, that's what everybody says. I said, test it, bet it, believe it, it's happening. Roll up the window, make my left, make another left enter into the surf shop, and as I go into the surf shop, my friend Robbie says, Doug, you're not going to believe it. Today we have a sale on shoes. shoes. Are you kidding, Robbie? You have a sale on shoes? Let me tell you. He goes, before you start, I only have two pairs. One's a size 8 and one's a size 10 and a half. I said, you're not going to believe this. But at the exit here, there is a man looking for shoes, and he is a 10 and a half. And my buddy said, let me stop you there. Go get them. So I went and got the shoes. Didn't cost me a dime. Got the shoes. Got my car. Went back around. Rolled up to his spot. Put my car in park. And people behind me were losing their minds. And they were saying they love me. They were like, give me the number one. You're number one. <laughs> it's like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just yelling things. And <laughs> um, I'm out of the car. I said, hey, I told you I was going to be back. Here's the shoes. Believe it. Here's the shoes. Everything we have is a gift from God. This is a gift for you from God. And I said, in fact, would you like to do something else today? And he goes, everybody says that. No one, no one ever comes through. And I'm like, well, uh, believe it, bet it. It's going to happen. So I thought since I stopped all this traffic, we would just spend a little bit more time together. He got his stuff together, got my car, and we, we had a nice afternoon together sharing some um, whatever we had that, that day. 
You see how God works. When you're focused on something, it dominates your life. But in the hands of God, extraordinary things happen. Once we take our minds off our stuff and put it upon the king of kings, in his hands, miracles. So it might not be sneakers for you. It might be something else. What you choose to focus on dominates your life. And so as we look into the story, we see that the wise men were seeking truth that was dominating their mind, and it led them to a savior. It led them to the king of kings. Now, Jerusalem was a city of religious intelligence. It was the center of the religious world, and six miles away, a savior was born. So take your Bibles, if you would. We're going to look at the story in Matthew chapter 2. Spending less isn't a call to stop giving gifts. It's a call to stop spending money on gifts we won't remember next year. America, as we saw, spends almost $450 billion during the Christmas season, and much of that spending is joyless, and it ends up on a credit card anyways. Are you with me? Sorry to get real this morning. Advertisers and corporations, they don't really want to worship Jesus. But they'll use that language of Christmas to lure us in to spend our money. Spend less on that kind of giving and more in the presence of God, in the presence of others. That's what we're saying when we say spend less. By spending wisely on gifts, it's going to free you from that anxiety that's associated with debt. Then you can take in this season with a full heart. You can take in this season for what it really represents. The birth of a savior, the birth of a chain breaker, the birth of the Messiah who came to set you free from your past, from your worry, from your fear, from your anxiety. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. We learned about that last week from an out-of-the-way town, an out-of-the-way place, a small city came a great savior. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Let's pause there. So who are these wise men? They're most likely pagan philosophers, astrologists, astronomer types, who were from priestly or ruling classes from their Eastern culture. They've come to Jerusalem looking for this so-called king of the Jews. Now, Herod, the current king, hears this and he is deeply troubled. 
along with the rest of the ruling class, along with the rest of the religious class. So Herod gets these wise men together, these scholars, to verify what's happening. And they verify from the ancient prophet that from Bethlehem, the Savior will be born. So then he calls the wise men in secret and says this, go search for this child. And as soon as you find him, tell me where he is so that I can go worship him. Now, if this sounds shady, it is. On one hand, he's very intimidated by the birth of the king of the Jews. He's He's very frightened by this king of kings who is coming to save the Messiah. Then on the other hand, he wants to go see him and worship him, which is a lie. You see, Herod is not a good guy. Herod is a ruthless killer. He is deeply troubled along with all all of those who were in power because of this Savior and this King of Kings. Herod, we read later, goes to great attempts to find this child. He kills family members. He had a plot to kill everyone in a stadium. Herod is is not a good guy. He is a ruthless killer. He is wanting to find the Savior for a a different purpose. But masking it in this, I want to go and worship him. He's using language that makes you think he wants to worship, but in his heart, he has different intentions. But part of his brilliance and part of his power is he gives the religious crowd what they want. He builds them, he rebuilds them a temple. But he became a paranoid leader, a paranoid tyrant. He had everything, but it wasn't enough. He had everything and had nothing. Now, this is an age-old story. Having everything but having nothing. Having it all but having nothing at all. And interestingly, anxiety and fear seem to go together. Anxiety and fear seem to always go together, yes? Having everything, yet because of fear and anxiety, you actually have nothing. You could be the most powerful man, the richest man in the world, as Herod, and still be dominated by anxiety and worry to the point where it chokes out all the life around you. Something shady. He wants to go and find the king of kings, but he has a different intention in his heart. A man who has everything, yet nothing. And it causes this anxiety and this fear and for chaos to be a part of his life. Look at Mark 8, 36. Mark 8, 36, this is a perfect definition of Herod's life. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, seemingly having everything but nothing? What's the everything in your mind? What is dominating your mind? What are you seeking? What do you think that you just cannot live without. You might sense when you get it, that longing, that desire won't go away. Having everything but having nothing. Now, compare this to Mary and Joseph, who 
quite literally had nothing. They have their baby in a stall or a barn or in a feeding trough, and yet they truly have it all. They have the one through whom all things were made. They have the creator, the savior, the Messiah, the master. They are bringing the life of God into the world, and not many people are paying attention. No fame, no buildings. They're not building him a temple. No power. And yet it's the most important moment in history. Here's the deep irony. In our current culture, during Christmas, there's this onslaught of buying and buying more. And it comes on the very day that we celebrate this impoverished birth of our God. The story's been hijacked. Corporations are using this holiday to make as much money as one possibly can. Christmas is when we buy stuff to celebrate the birthday of a Savior who renounces having stuff. The 9 o'clock service loved that. I had to repeat it. (laughs) But you guys are still thinking about sneakers or something. I'm not sure what you're thinking about. Buying stuff. When we're celebrating the birthday of a Savior who renounces having stuff. Something's wrong. The current culture doesn't want to worship Jesus. They just want to lure us in with the language to get what they want from us. Herod didn't want to go worship Jesus. He wanted to use it for his own agenda. Are you with me? Had everything but yet nothing. Having it all more and more doesn't mean having life. Sorry, let me get off my little soapbox and let's get back to the story. Back to the wise men. Verse 9, after this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, get this, comma, get this, underline this. When they saw the star, circle this, okay? All right. When they, uh, highlight this, please. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. That's the call of Christmas. The joy of the Savior who has come to set us free. He has come to release you from the pain of your past. And we come and bow and worship him. That is our focus, that dominant focus which influences our life. We don't come and bow and and worship that fourth gift that we buy our aunt that already has everything. We come and we worship the king of kings who has come to set you free. He has your best interest in mind. He has a plan for your life. You know what? That was breaking, that's what was breaking my heart today. I know a Savior, and he knows your name. You know how I remind myself that, that way? And I know this is really cheesy, but I have all my name tags in my Bible. <laughs> all right, see this name tag here? I'd like you guys to start wearing your name tags, by the way. I have these name tags in my Bible. This reminds me that Jesus knows my name. And I'm reminded by it every day. And he has a plan and he has an agenda for you. And you will never be the same. That is what brings us joy. Amen? And the Savior has been born and we come and we bow and we worship him. That is the true story of Christmas that the wise men found. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold frankincense, and myrrh. I'm not talking about not giving gifts. Sometimes it's a great expression to give gifts. It's 
It's very meaningful, yes? When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Herod was not a good guy, and God came through and spoke to these wise men and threw a dream and said, that guy's a ruthless guy. God has our back. God will come through. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus was born six miles outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the epicenter of religious activity at the time of Jesus' birth. All kinds of spiritual activities were taking place in Jerusalem. All the major religious leaders of the world were in Jerusalem. But none of them were seeking Jesus. Six miles away, in their midst, but they were missing it. They were not seeking Jesus. Who was seeking Jesus? It was the people on the outside. From a different culture, the wise men. Shepherds who are on the margins of society. God does his best work. On the margins. God does his best work in an upside down kingdom. God does his best work in a counter cultural way. Amen. You have Jesus here. We have Jesus here right in our midst, but sometimes we still don't see him. Six miles away, right in their midst, but they were missing him. You can have Jesus right here and still miss him if you're not looking for him. That's our focus. That's what we seek. We are looking for Jesus so it dominates every decision we make, every word we speak, every relationship we're into. We're looking for Jesus. It makes our marriages glorify him. It makes our relationships glorify him. We bring hope to the city because love is born. And hope is here. We seek Jesus. We are in his midst. Mi, mi, how do you say that word? M-I-D-S-T. I know how to spell it. Huh? Midst. I still can't say it. Presence. Right here. But if you're not looking for him, you miss him. He doesn't miss you. So if you don't feel like the right kind of Christian, maybe you don't feel like the right kind of Christian, the kind of Christian in the story is also on the wrong side of history. The religious establishment sided with Herod and his empire, and they missed Jesus, the story of Christmas invites us to seek the truth, to be discerning when religion and power begin to mingle. So if you don't feel like you are the right kind of Christian, you're in good company. Because that kind of Christian in this story missed it as well. This stirs such a passion in my heart. As Jesus works on the outside, as Jesus sets us free, we receive life. We're going to enter into a new year, and I believe this year, 2017, will be a year And I'm waiting. Every year we come to this time, instead of making a New Year's resolution, we pray that God gives us a word. Last year, my word was jubilee, which means chains will be broken, which means forgiveness. And God did something in my life that has never happened before. He broke some chains of my past that I had been holding on to for 25 years. In 2016, that 
chain was broken. It was a year of jubilee for me. I already told you what it was. I have struggled that I'm not that typical pastor, and I'm tired of people telling me that, and I just would, would focus on it. God set me free from it. I'm not trying to be anybody else but who he made me. And that's why it just stirs in my heart because I want you to know that same truth. And so if you don't feel like you're the right kind of Christian, you're in good company, as this story suggests. Six miles away, and they missed it because they weren't looking for it. This Christmas, we're looking for it. This year, we're looking for it. We are focused on the living God. Not to be satisfied with services and mere religious goods, but to look in out-of-the-way places where God is doing something. So we invite you this year to not give in to corporations and advertisers that really don't want to worship Jesus. They just want to lure you in with the language of truth so that you'll spend your money on dumb stuff. We want to seek the King of Kings, the Savior. That is our focus. May you recognize that having it all is not having it all. Having Jesus is all that we need. Amen? And so may your truth be found in the words and ways of Jesus. And so may your truth-seeking lead you to Jesus. And may you be captured by this wonder around this different kind of king who represents peace and love and grace and truth. That's a much better gift to open up than an Xbox. That's a much better gift to open up than anything you'll find at the mall. That is who he represents. He is in our presence or in our midst right now. Don't miss it. We're going to end our time with a word of prayer. We'll continue this story next week. And I want this prayer to be personal. What are you seeking? God has a gift for you that he wants you to open up that has his plan for you to set you free. God has a gift for you that he wants you to open up that will bring you joy, that will bring you hope. Make it personal. Make it specific as you pray before we leave. What are you seeking? What are you focused on? Because it dominates your life right now. Sneakers or Jesus? We're going to pray. And following the prayer, have you just remain seated. We are going to uh, receive an offering for our sister church in Sacramento City, the Sacramento City Community Church. We introduced this to you last week. This is our Christmas project of the, the, the season. We're going to bless this, um, this inner city church that has great needs. And $5, $2, a quarter, it all matters. We want to give them and bless the church and their pastoral family with a gift this, this morning. But as we pray, make it personal. Let's pray. You are in our midst this morning, Jesus. Your presence is so aware to our hearts. You're stirring our hearts. Our desire is to be focused on you, to be obedient to you, to be made available for you. We don't want to have the whole world and lose our soul. We don't want to miss it. You were born six miles outside of where all religious activity was taking place. They missed it. Open our eyes to these things that are not seen. Stir up this generation for your plan and for your purpose. We are hungry. Hungry for you.
desperate for you. We can't take another step without you. We're at the end of our hope without you. But love came when you were born. And hope is here. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As the plates are passed, if, as they pass your